Hi everyone and welcome to our 10 in 10 AP Psych Review where I'm going to try to spend the next 10 minutes going over what I think are 10 essential concepts for you to know from the sensation and perception unit. Are you ready? Here we go. So the first thing you need to know, right, is top down, top or down processing, right? So is it top down or bottom up processing? We talk about sensation and perception. There's two ways that we usually look at things, right? Bottom up processing is when the information comes from the environment and then goes through what I consider the bottom, anything below the brain. So through your fingertips, your nose, your eyes, and then up to the brain and the brain analyzes it. Versus top down, that's where your brain almost tells your eyes, your ears, whatever, what to expect and it tells it what to see or hear or smell as opposed to what's actually there, right? Top down is basically perception. Almost everything you do is a combination of bottom up and top down now that you've been alive for so long. But when you're younger, you experience a lot of things through bottom up, right? And then as you get older, you come to have expectations of things. And so your brain kind of makes good guesses ahead of what might really be there. The next thing you have to understand is absolute threshold. Well, thresholds in general, right? So the first one is absolute thresholds, okay? So the question is, how do we know if something is there, right? How do you know if you smell something? How do you know if you taste something? How do you know if you hear something, right? Well, the uh, argument is, is that people have, or as a group, we have an absolute threshold. That's what you can detect 50% of the time. So if you are at 20 feet and you can see a candle flickering 20 feet away, and then you go to 21 feet, it disappears, 20 feet, it's there, 20, what, 21 feet, okay, back and forth, whatever, right? Whatever you can see, whenever you can see that candle 50% of the time, that's your absolute threshold. And yours and mine might be slightly different, right? But then they do have absolute thresholds uh, for the general population. Now, signal detection theory kind of says, no way. That's not true. There isn't such thing as a minimum threshold that 50% of the time you detect this. Actually, what they think it's all about is your detection of a stimuli is based on your motivation, your experience, your fatigue, right? So the example I like to use about this is the, fa the phantom vibration of the cell phone, right? So your cell phone's ringing and, or your cell phone vibrates and you pick it up, but there's no text message. Huh? I could have swore it vibrated, right? So that's a perfect example of signal detection theory. What they would say is that because maybe you were expecting a phone call, right, or because you know what the vibration feels like, that you're more likely to assume that there was one even when there wasn't one, right? And that you are much more likely to detect a uh, vibration if you know a text is coming versus if you're not like paying attention to a text, or maybe you're really tired and you're not paying attention to anything at all, right? So they think that your detection is based on motivation, uh, environment, or like fatigue, and um, like how long experience, if you've been doing it for a long time, if it's a skill, or like if you uh, have had it happen to you before. Okay, so now that we know if the stimulus is there or not, how do we know if it's different than something else, right? So how do we know when two smells are not exactly the same? You know, you smell two perfumes and they're like kind of the same, but not exactly the same. But sometimes you smell two perfumes and you're like, what? Does that even, they gotta smell the same, right? So what needs to be different about them? What's the minimum amount of difference that they need in order for you to detect that they're not the same, okay? When we're talking about difference threshold, we use something called Weber's Law. And Weber's Law simply states that when you worry about the difference, it has to be a percentage change and not an amount change. So if I'm looking at a perfume formula and I add two more percent vanilla, I have to add two percent more vanilla. I can't add like two drops of vanilla, right? Because what if the original calculation formula is slightly different and so two drops in one is a much bigger amount than two drops in the other. So you need to add a constant percentage of change, not an amount of change, okay? And remember, oftentimes companies use a just noticeable difference to get you to look at their products once again, right? So as we have over here, the change in Starbucks as time goes on, not so different that you don't recognize it, but just different enough for you to go ahead and take a look when they come out with something a little new. Okay, so the next thing you should know is transduction, right? Each of your senses has its own uh, transduction place, right? It has its own place where the messages come from the outside and then they get transformed into neural impulses. The brain cannot read light waves. The brain can't read sound waves. It can't read chemicals. It can't read any of that stuff. The only thing it can read is 
neural impulses. So when the information goes in through your eye, right, transduction happens in the retina. The transduction site of the eye is the retina, right? In the retina, it gets changed to a neural impulse, and then it goes to the brain, and the brain reads it, right? And if you remember, before it goes to the occipital lobe, it has to go through the thalamus, right? So each of your different senses has a different transformation or a transduction site, right? Where the information is transformed from a neural or from a chemical or a um, electrical or a light wave into a thing that your brain can read, a neural message your brain can read. Okay, so let's focus a little bit on the eye, right? This is a picture of the eye, okay? Normally, you don't have to label things on a diagram or you don't have to pick out things on a diagram on the AP test, but sometimes you do, right? So it's good that you're familiar with a diagram of the eye, but what I want you to focus on is some of the most important parts. So first thing you got to know is you've got to know the retina. That's where the magic happens, okay? Inside the retina are the rods and cones. How do you remember what they do? Well, cones are for color, C, color, and they're also in the center, right? Cones, color, center. C's, right? The rods, they're in the periphery, okay? So they're on your peripheral vision, and they are good for, um, like, light, right? So they are good in dark light, in dim light. In bright light, cones work just fine. It's in dim light that you really need your rods to be able to see what's going on. And as you can tell, those rods and cones are attached to bipolar cells, which are then attached to ganglion cells. The ganglion cells make the axons of the optic nerve, right? And when the optic nerve leaves the eye, you have a blind spot, right? So in that small little teeny tiny place, there's no retina, so you have a blind spot, okay? One more thing I want to point out, right, about the cones and the center and the color, right, is a part of the eye called the fova, right? So the fova is where it is the clearest, you have visual acuity, right? There's lots of cones there, um, and it is where you have the clearest vision. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about the eye, I want to focus on color, right? I'm sure all of you have seen this dress. Is it yellow or blue? Is it black and white? What color is the dress, right? And hopefully you remember that color isn't real, right? Color is something that your brain creates from light waves. I know, it's very Matrix-like. So there's two major theories that you have to know about color. The first theory is the trichromatic theory. And the way we remember what it is is that word tri, right? Three. So you have three basic colors that your cones use to see all other colors, red, green, and blue, okay? All these colors work in combination to produce other colors. Now, what's the proof that this theory is legitimate? Well, people are red-green colorblind, they're red-blue colorblind, they're blue colorblind, right? And so colorblindness from these colors demonstrates that they must be important and that they those three are the basis, the foundation. Okay, but you know what? Just one theory is never enough because that's how we roll in psychology. So now there's another theory, right? And this theory is the opponent process theory. This theory states that uh, your uh, color works in pairs. So red goes with green, blue goes with yellow, and black goes with white. And when one of the pairs is activated, so you're staring at the color, so right now you're staring at black and white, the other one is like turned off or inhibited. But then as soon as you look away to like a new, a blank slate, then the other color is activated. I'm sure that you guys did some of these in class, and I know we did the one in class uh, where you got to see you got to see Jesus, right? They're called after images, where you stare at it, and then it goes away, and then you look at something white or blank, and you see a whole brand new image, okay? Both of these theories are true. Trichromatic works in the cones. Opponent process theory works in the bipolar cells. All right, so on from vision, here we are at hearing, okay? What are some of the things you got to know about the ear? Well, first thing you should definitely know is the eardrum, okay? You should know the eardrum. You should know the eardrum vibrates, right? And that vibration goes through the middle, the bones in the middle ear, right? So you have hammer, anvil, and stirrup, the ossicles, the tiniest little bones in the body, right? And then you know, you see right here, right? Hammer, anvil, stirrup, it goes into the cochlea. And in the cochlea, you have the basilar membrane. And in the basilar membrane, or on the basilar membrane, you have cilla, right? And so the cochlea... And the basilar membrane are the retina of the ear, right? They are the transduction site. They are where the magic happens, okay? And then, of course, it goes to your thalamus and then to your temporal lobe. Okay, so now that we know the main parts of the ear that you need to focus on, 
again, we have some theories of hearing, right? So that's fine. We know where the transduction takes place, but how do you know what sound it is, right? How does your brain know? So again, two theories. Well, actually three, but two main ones. So the first theory I want you to know is the place theory, okay? This theory states that the hair cells determine the pitch of the sound. So the hair cells just wait there, and then they know what pitch because the sound wave hits at a certain location. And then those hair cells at that location activate, and then that sends a message to your brain that it was these hair cells and this location, and so it must be this sound, right? It's the place theory, a place, a location. Hey, let's meet at your place, right? They're going to your house. House, okay. This is really good for high frequency sounds. Frequency matching theory, right, is the entire cochlea determines the pitch of the sound, not just a place, but the entire thing based on the rate that the cells are firing. And the cells fire at a rate that matches the frequency of the wave. So if a wave is moving at 100 waves per second, then the pulse in your uh, auditory nerve and your hair cells will fire at 100 uh, pulses per second, okay? And this is good for low th- for low sounds. But neither of these, sometimes we always talk about the volley theory, which is like a combination of those things. It's like the hair cells fire kind of like in canon, like one, then the other, then the third, then the fourth, right? They kind of go back and forth, okay? But I think as long as you know the place and the frequency matching theory, you should be good to go. All right, this is number eight, not number seven. Number eight is sensory interaction, right? So I didn't talk about olfaction and I didn't talk about gustatory sense, right? You got to know those. You got to know olfaction is smell. You got to know the olfactory bulb and you got to know gustatory or uh, you have to know your sense of taste, right? And you have those five main sense of taste. So you have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, right? Okay, so you don't have to know much more about them. It's not like the eye and the ear, but there are some other things I would like you to know. So Sensory interaction, right? How the senses impact each other. Smell and taste have a huge impact on each other, okay? If you can't smell, you often can't taste. Both smell and taste are chemical senses. They don't work on sound waves or light waves. They work through chemicals, okay? And they both have their own transduction sites, and they both have their own receptor cells, just like the eye and the ear, although we know less about them, so you don't have to know them in as much detail, Taste also impacts your, or vision also impacts your taste. So if something looks gross, you think it's going to taste gross. And then there's this really cool illusion called the McGurk effect. And this is sensory interaction between sound and hearing. So this is the thing where you'll see someone go, ba, ba, ba. But really they're saying their mouth, right? They do a voiceover of them saying, ga, ga. So they'll play the ba, ba sound, but you'll see the ga, ga mouth. And you can't hear it correctly because you're watching the mouth for the ba sound. That's called the McGurk effect. All right, skin senses, right? So your sense of touch, tactile sense, okay? One theory that you really got to know for your sense of touch is the gate control theory, okay? Now, the gate control theory is an imaginary gate. There is not a real gate, right? But the idea is, is that in your spinal cord, the gate opens when pain sensations go through it and that you are able to close or to lower the gate based on if you're able to, like you can um, send mixed messages. So like you can rub something, right? If you bump it, you can rub it and it feels better, right? Or it hurts less, okay? So you can send a confusing messages up through the spinal cord. Okay, your vestibular sense, right? So my students always forget that the vestibular sense is located in the semicircular canals. So the way that you remember this is the word circular. And when you spin round and round and round and round, right, you get dizzy and your vestibular sense is your sense of balance and body position, right? When you tilt your head down, it is your semicircular canals that tell the rest of your body that your head is tilted down or back or right or left, right? So this sense is located in the semicircular canals. And last but not least, right, is your sense of either kinesthetic sense or proprioception. And this is your body awareness. Well, it's your awareness of your body in space, right? So both of these pictures, people are testing their proprioception. And if you're wondering where proprioception lives, right, where is its transduction site, it's in your joints, right? Uh, it's, you know, and when you move, right, joints and muscles send information to the brain about the position of your body. If you want to try these, you should do it. You can close your eyes and try to see if your fingertips can touch exactly, right? Do you know where your body is without looking at it? That's your sense of proprioception. All right, that's all for this 10 and 10 review, AP Psychos. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.